Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at On Downtime and Domain, which is, I believe, how you say that word. This is a book of downtime activities. It's a supplement that helps you make city adventures and the space between your normal dungeon crawling and wilderness adventures more interesting, more fruitful, and easier to gamify, if you will. So when players want to do things like set up a side business or they want to earn money fighting in an arena, you don't have to make something up on the fly. You can use one of the many little subsystems in this book. Here's our back cover. Do you wish you didn't have to put in so much effort into engaging your players? Wouldn't it be nice if they couldn't wait to play around in your world? If they were pushing you to spend more time in the land you create? No longer will your players wonder what their characters should do with all that gold. On Downtime and Domain includes clear common sense rules for everything from starting a cult, making sacrifices to gods, to hiring mercenaries, and building vehicles and castles. The book is written by Courtney Campbell, and one fun thing is that if you look at the initials, it's ODND, &D, which is a theme that we will be seeing in several other of uh, Courtney's books going forward. Before we check out what we get inside this book here, a quick shout out to today's sponsor. This episode is brought to you by Into the AM and their series of fantasy and sci fi themed t shirts. The shirt that I'm wearing right now is a really great choice to wear if you are dungeon mastering really any kind of a D&D like game. But there's plenty of other great designs over on their web store as well. If you watch this channel a lot, you'll notice that I basically only wear their shirts at this point. It's pretty much my whole wardrobe. Shirts are really comfortable and they are really affordable too. They often have great deals going on over at their web store. And if you use my link in the description below, you can get an additional 10% off of whatever deal you're already getting. Thanks again to Into the Amber sponsoring. Now let's get back to the show. All right, here's our table of contents. Some of the things included are the different places, civilization, navigation, uh, city random encounters, different activities and labor that you can do, uh, mostly for making money while you're in between adventures, characters and people you can encounter, uh, wealth and prosperity like markets and hordes, crime, mining and expeditions, constructing, so we need to want to build some new castles or fortifications, uh, engines, vehicles, and gaining influence within cities, integrating rumors into your adventures, and a bunch of appendices for extra stuff. At the beginning, we look at cities in general, what medieval cities were like, what their populations were generally like, and how dense a typical medieval six-mile hex would be, the kinds of um, cities, hamlets, monster layers, and so on that you would find inside of it. Some basic procedures for running a city. If the players generally want to find something in a city, then there's no reason to not just give it to them, especially if it's big enough. Let the players actually take control for a change. Uh, rules for navigation and getting around in a city. Some procedures for that if you want to do that. And different types of random city encounters, like large dramatic events, uh, types of people you might run into, supernatural encounters, or more normal events. You could put these onto your own random table, depending on the kind of city that you happen to be making. There's lots of great random tables sprinkled throughout this book. For example, 100 Obnoxious Peasants, all of which are really great and flavorful and a lot of fun to run. So for example, let's pick one at random here. Uh, Kemeny Cracklet, the fastest kid in the orphanage, wants to become an adventurer's apprentice. Won't take no for an answer. Will work for free and catch rats and steal scraps to eat. They're all stuff like that. Just great little punchy descriptions um, full of flavor and they're gonna be very memorable for your players. We also have 100 noble patrons. For example, Lord Nimian Falzer offers good money for objects of art from dungeons or ruins. He is known as a lone shark who has debtors beaten and tortured and families sold into slavery abroad. As a buyer, he seems reasonable and offers his aid or loans to adventurers after a few deals between friends. Most of these people have little twists that will get you in serious trouble if you don't watch yourself, which is great because it just adds more complications. This section is on activities and labor. It's just tons of different things that you can do in a city. For example, carousing. Spending money on carousing can give you more experience points. If you want to do some philanthropy, it's got you covered. How about gourmandizing? Going around and eating the best food in the city. Roll a random table to see uh, how well that goes for you. Research, study, and meditation. Want to sacrifice things to dark gods? Well, it's not going to work out for you probably in the long run, but in the short run, you might get a lot of XP. Um, you can do things like uh, advancing skills. If you don't have skills in your game, there's a way that you can add that in here. Professional income, collecting in your own arcane library, scribing scrolls, brewing potions, researching new spells, quests, arena fights, uh, along with some advice on uh, some fun enemies that you can fight in there and some ways to spice up the arena so it's more fun to fight in. Assassination, racketeering, banditry, gambling, everything that you might need to make uh, a nefarious living when you are in between adventures. There's a whole section here on hirelings, henchmen, mercenary sidekicks, pets, and followers. A lot of this reminds me a little bit of the stuff that I read in AD&D, 
it seems a little bit uh, more streamlined and simplified. Still fairly complex for my taste, but that's not really a big deal because it's easy to take stuff out, right? So you can easily slim stuff down to your taste, um, but it has general rulings for how you handle most stuff, including morality and uh, loyalty for henchmen, uh, the different costs of different types of mercenaries in gold pieces per month, how you might want to train henchmen, example mercenaries and companies, a lot of which are, again, full of flavor. So for example, the amulet children, the entire company is composed of these children of a shockingly prolific Vaudon master. They cover their bodies in amulets and protective tattoos. They believe in all gods and all devils. They speak to spirits using a secret patois of their own devising. Awesome. If you want to generate henchmen, there's lots of different examples of different um, activities or different professions they may have had in the past. Rules for running town guards, how to get your own henchmen and hirelings, along with problems, of course, that will manifest after a while because you can't have an adventure without problems. Inquiring congregants, if you are a cleric, why do you want to do that? Well, the more congregants that you have, the cheaper it gets to do clerical stuff. For example, crafting magic items, researching new spells, uh, casting ritual spells, and so on. Lots of information here on sages. The big difference here between this and, say, AD&D is that in AD&D, there's always a chance that you can spend tons of money on a sage and they can't give you any information. The change here is that sages are always going to give you correct information if you pay for it. So you're not wasting your money. That incentivizes players a lot more to, um, to participate in using sages. It lets them basically force the GM to give them information about the setting, which is great. It gives the players more control. One focus that we see in a lot of um, Courtney's books here is that it's very important to allow players to take control of the setting and also to allow them to make good choices. And they can't make good choices without information. So give the players the information they need in order to uh, give them the ability to make those choices. Rules for permanently retaining your own sage, different specializations that your sage can have. Lots of great stuff if you want to randomly generate that. We have a section on wealth and prosperity, including running markets, uh, haggling, uh, investments, lifestyle, clan hordes, random items for sale at a bazaar. This is really great stuff. Just if you want weird items that you can throw at players when they're digging around for stuff in a marketplace, for example, a lion pelt, a tincture of moon tea, a bottle of well-aged plum wine, a blue glazed pottery pitcher with a wide handle and a lip for easy pouring, just all sorts of fun stuff like that. And there's some unusual items you might find here, like the bioluminescent organs of a fire beetle, probably something that you could use in a potion. No shortage of these. There's like a D100 tables for everything here. A list of 10 strange pet stores, because yes, you can acquire your own pets. For example, the floating piranha shop. Each of these has a description, the proprietor, uh, the plot hook and a rumor attached to it, a unique trinket, and so forth. The glowworm emporium, the ant farm, the gallery of goo, small but vicious chickens. That's a Warhammer reference right there. And a whole section on crime, because you know players tend to be criminals, and a way to run a court system where you can try and bribe people, you can try and present evidence to affect this particular dice roll that will affect uh, how much punishment you will uh, get for doing that crime. And there's all sorts of uh, medieval punishments here in this table that you can use. Rules for mining and creating your own mine that you can extract um, wealth from. Though again, that's a little bit too complex for me, but you could always simplify it. There's a whole section here on clearing and securing terrain, because if you want to start constructing buildings, you'll need to clear out the hexes around it, and a system for expeditions. So what this does is this abstracts the whole process of getting together a band of fighters and taking out all the beholders and so on nearby where you want to build your castle. Instead, you can abstract that and do this all in just a couple of rolls, where the number of monsters that you fight will simply reduce your expedition value as you fight more and more of them. There's different expedition events that you can encounter here, once per day, different crises that you might encounter, uh, how to keep track of supplies, and uh, different types of goblin mischief that you can run into as well. We have a section on construction and how to build, or the cost at least, and the time for building different types of buildings. Everything broken down both more abstractly, just like large stone buildings, large wooden buildings, and more specific things, like you want to know the cost for doors, windows, roofing, and all of that stuff. So it really depends on how granular you want to get there. You can also just have the players generally give you a blueprint of the sort of building that you want to build, and then use these tables to give at least a pretty good ballpark of what that's going to cost. There's also a whole system in here for crafting your own unique vehicles. Like you get the original frame here with the tonnage attached to it, then you can modify that with the different kinds of uh, material, 
You can add modifications to it like rams, rigging, pneumatic tubes, reinforced frames, and things like that. Modules to add on like docking bays or uh, bunks only or turrets, different types of weapons. You can add uh, engines onto this thing depending on how you want to drive it. There's also a whole section of vehicle quirks here that are unintended things that your ship or your vehicle may acquire. These could be good things or they could be bad things depending on uh, what you roll. Anything from a sleek ram to a loose ram, perhaps it's ill-fortuned or perhaps it's lucky. You never know what you're gonna get. A section on vats, golems, crossbreeds, and other experiments if you wanna start making your own weird hybrid animals. And then we get to the section on influence. And this is an abstract system for building up a level of influence in a city with the different types of forces. For example, the commercial forces, military, aristocratic, or arcane slash religious forces. You can fill in these little boxes as you um, gain more influence there, and then you can spend that influence in order to uh, affect change. For example, when it comes to the military, if you have some major leverage, you could employ some mercenaries. Or with the arcane and religious factions, if you had grand leverage there, you might be allowed to construct a school or a church. Any good city has to be packed with adventure seeds that the players can use, and this has plenty of examples of how to do that. And it has whole essays and philosophies on how you design staged rumors, where you have um, rumors that they pick up in town, things that they can learn through research, and things that they can discover themselves. By sprinkling these rumors all over your setting, you'll have uh, lots of different ways for players to find this information and feel like it's a lot more of their doing that they pulled this information out. And it adds a lot more variety to the kinds of information and the kinds of rumors that you can give them. Of course, we have a gigantic table of lots of different sandbox ideas, different types of rumors that you can throw in there, like reports have come of in of a living dungeon, or many of the old ruins in the swamp contain great and ancient treasure, or perhaps darkness and evil emanates from a dark tower. All the sorts of basic tropes that you can use. We have a short section on time and calendars that features lots of unusual seasonal events that you can throw in here, and you can create your own calendar, of course, depending on the type of setting that you are creating. Uh, and Appendix B for inheritances that you can inherit if um, perhaps a weird relative dies. Strange inheritances like the deed to a prison hulk, the Argentium, along with the ownership of all 20 madmen imprisoned inside. They are the despondent remnants of a doomsday cult. What are you going to do with that? That's the source of adventure right there. We have some timekeeping aids, some examples of calendars, though you probably want to create your own. These are just from a uh, classic and I think from one that Courtney created himself. Uh, a section on trade goods, if you really want to get into the mercantile side of things, then you have uh, ways to calculate the costs of large amounts of grain and foodstuffs, wine, ale, beer, and liquor, things like that. Also, we have high value goods like gold, ivory, narcotics, uh, religious artifacts, magical components, and so on. Appendix E is all about generating your own hex content. So there's a whole system for that. Choose a primary terrain type, determine the contents of the hex, determine the contents of the layers there. Um, determine what ruins exist in that hex, the inhabitants of the hamlets, the castle and population center inhabitants, if there are any, and then draw it all down on a hex. Lots of seeds here for the different ruin types that you might find in a hex, for temples, for towers, for forts, landmarks, and features, and lots of information that you can use to design your own cities and villages. A generator for castles, including its size, the monstrous inhabitants, um, the men that are there, dungeon doors, if you need that sort of thing and a whole bunch of example villages ready to go. Each of these villages like Sauton Port has a description like a sleepy chaotic port village filled with decayed fountains and broken yellow brick. Along with its own little motto, the demographics of how that works, the government, the population, the local religions, uh, the different districts that you can find there, along with specific places and people, everything you would need to just drop that into a setting and then start using it. Other towns include Carwin's Gate, we have Sludge Bridge, Denze, and strange funeral rites, just another extra fun little random table if you want some weird um, ceremonies to add to your cities. So that's it for On Downtime and Domains. It's available in PDF or in print on demand form over at DriveThruRPG. As usual, links will be in the description below. It seems like one of the most comprehensive books that I've read that just focuses on this one particular thing, which is how to make that downtime in a city as activity filled and as uh, procedure driven as possible so that players will know how they can do stuff and you won't have to make up these systems on the fly. So if your players are looking for that sort of thing, if they're spending a lot of time in cities and they want to start digging their claws into the setting and setting down roots and building buildings and things like that, this seems like the perfect book for that. Um, it is a print on demand uh, book from Drive Through RPG. As usual, I'll put links 
in the description below where you can pick it up for yourself in PDF or in print form. And at least at the time of writing this, there is a compilation bundle of this and its two sequels where you can get them all at a discounted price. Um, I'll be doing reviews on the sequels in just a little bit. Thanks again for watching everybody. I'll see you next time.